Hi, my name is Bob Nielsen. I'm a retired professor of agronomy and extension corn specialist at Purdue University. Today I want to share with you the results of research that we've conducted looking at yield response to plant population. This research was conducted in collaboration with my colleague Jim Camerato, who's our soil fertility specialist here at Purdue. Grain yield and corn can be defined as the product of the individual components of yield, which are plants per unit area, number of ears per plant, number of kernels per ear, and weight per kernel. Yield can be increased by increasing one or more of these yield components, and of course, plants per unit area or seeding rate is the yield component that's most easily managed by farmers. So thus the interest in choosing a seeding rate and targeting an optimum population. These yield components are not physiologically independent of each other, meaning that increasing plant population in hopes of increasing yield triggers a sort of balancing act among the other yield components. Let me try to illustrate that with this yield component formula. So increasing number of plants per acre, which generally increases the number of ears per acre, uh, if everything else stays the same, that's positive for increasing yield. However, as plant population increases, normally ear size per plant decreases, and of course that's potentially not good. So the balancing act involves this quest for increasing plants per acre just enough so that the reduction in ear size doesn't negate uh, the positive impact of increasing population. This graph illustrates the response of kernel number per ear to increasing populations. This was a trial conducted by one of our graduate students back in 2013 and 14, where he looked at the responses of two different hybrids to population in terms of kernel number per ear. And the graph illustrates that kernel numbers decreased with the very first increase in plant population uh, at a fairly steady linear rate. The same kind of response occurs with weight per kernel. As soon as we start increasing populations, the weight per kernel begins to decrease. So again, this is this forms the balancing act of you know, how much can we increase population without losing too much because of the reductions in kernel numbers per ear or weight per kernel. So the optimum population is that population which consistently balances that upside of increasing ear numbers per acre with the downside of decreased ear size. And when I say consistently, I'm referring to performance of over a wide range of growing conditions. Uh, we don't grow corn in a perfect environment. Some years come close to being perfect. Other years have a lot of stress. And the response of corn to population varies a little bit uh, because of that stress. So we need to identify the optimum population that consistently balances these yield components. <clears throat> and furthermore, the optimum population uh, is also the one which maintains acceptable stock health and integrity and thus minimizing the risk of harvesting problems associated with corn that goes down or lodges severely. Now across Indiana, uh, every year, the USDA uh, sends out surveys to growers and asking them to report the harvest populations of their corn. And corn harvest populations have been increasing steadily for decades. When I started at Purdue in 1982, the average reported harvest population for growers in Indiana was just under 21, or I'm sorry, just under 22,000 plants per acre. At the end of 2022, that number had risen to about 29,000 plants per acre. The annual increase in this harvest population uh, is about 267 plants per acre per year. 
And that compares to uh, similar rates in Illinois to our west and Ohio to our east. This slow but steady increase in harvest populations that farmers report uh, has been enabled by the slow and steady increase or improvement in overall stress tolerance and hybrids. And I say that because high plant populations by itself imposes physiological stress on the corn plant. So as hybrids overall stress tolerance has been improved by plant breeders, that has led then to the ability to continue raising populations slowly and surely because the hybrids tolerate that stress better, which essentially means the reduction in ear size becomes less as hybrids are better able to tolerate those higher populations. Now, in 2008, uh, the Purdue's guidelines for seeding rates and plant populations were largely based on data that had been generated at the University of Illinois in the 1990s. There wasn't much reason to repeat that work uh, because these, this was a pretty comprehensive set of data. But, you know, as we get out to 2008, you know, we're starting to look at, you know, upwards of 15 years maybe since that data was published. So it was about time to start looking at it again. I had conducted a few trials in 2001 to 2005 that included plant populations. However, the available field size for those trials limited the number of seeding rates. And so it really was not a good data set to use for coming up with uh, revised guidelines. And then another driver at about that time period that uh, encouraged us to start looking at yield response to population more seriously was the fact that seed cost per acre nearly doubled in 2008 versus the prior years. In 2007, for example, the average seed cost was about $43 per acre, whereas in 2008, uh, it had increased to $79 per acre. And seed cost today now is upwards of $124 per acre. This represents about 17% of the total variable cost of production for corn for Indiana growers, and that's second only to the cost of nitrogen fertilizer. So it's a very costly crop input for growers. And so you can imagine every thousand seeds planted beyond the optimum rate represents three to four dollars per acre of simply unnecessary cost. And so this balancing act that I talked about is not just about maximizing grain yield, but also about avoiding unnecessary seed expense. <clears throat> Beginning with the 2008 crop season, Jim and I began to conduct field scale trials around the state to evaluate corn response to plant population. These trials were conducted at a number of Purdue's agricultural research centers around the state, as well as a number of on-farm trials with farmer collaborators. We used commercial farm equipment in all of these trials equipped with precision ag technologies. Individual plot size ranged from 30 feet to 60 feet wide by length of field. The trials normally included five to six seeding rates, and they were replicated five to six times, giving us 30 to 35 uh, plots per trial. The seeding rates that we evaluated typically ranged from about 25,000 to 42,000 plants per acre, and we used a large range like that because we wanted to make sure that we bracketed the optimum population range, uh, and it's also fairly necessary to, to have that large of a range in order to accurately describe mathematically that yield response to plant population. Here's an example of one of our larger trials. This happened to be a 150-acre trial in southeast Indiana. Each colored rectangle on this seeding rate map represents individual plots that were 40 feet wide by about 4,600 feet long. If you look closely and count the number of different colors, you'll see there's six different colors, which represent the six seeding rates that we had chosen for the trial, and each of them was replicated six times. <clears throat> 
the spatial seating rate map itself was created with GIS software uh, to fit the boundaries or the perimeter of the field. We then exported that map as a file to give to the farmer who uh, imported it into the electronic display in the tractor. It was read, so to speak, by the variable rate software in that display. And those seating rates were then implemented on the go using the variable rate seating planter technology. Now, the nice thing about that technology is that it greatly simplifies the logistics of planting. All the farmer had to do was pull into the field and start planting, and the seating rates would be changed automatically based on the seating rate map. And that also then simplified the replication of the treatments, the randomization of them within the field. Um, and then later on, as we harvested the yield data, we could literally in intersect these uh, this seeding rate map with the yield data to facilitate our later analysis. <coughs> so the upshot of it is by now we've accumulated about 100 data sets uh, from trials around the state. And the counties where we've had trials are highlighted in green on that state map. Most of the trials involved a single hybrid and a single nitrogen fertilizer rate, although those varied one trial to another. 30 of the trials, though, we included pairs of hybrids chosen on purpose uh, to represent uh, hybrids that are characterized by the seed companies as being more responsive or less responsive to plant populations. Eight of the trials included normal and higher than normal nitrogen fertilizer rates to address the question of whether higher populations require higher nitrogen rates. And then finally, uh, the spatial arrangement of soil map units in some of these trials allowed us to evaluate soil-specific yield responses to plant populations. Now, the fact that missing plants do not produce grain uh, told us that we needed to analyze the yield responses with respect to actual plant populations rather than the targeted seeding rates because the two are rarely identical in the field and it just doesn't make sense to analyze the yield responses according to seeding rate. Final populations are usually lower than seeding rates due to germination problems, emergence problems, subsequent death of plants during the rest of the season. And unfortunately, as you read some other published reports, you might uh, not be able to determine whether they're talking about seeding rates or populations in the way that they craft their graphs and, and the language in the body. And so sometimes their guidelines can be a, a little uncertain or a little nebulous. Now, the majority of the yield responses that we've seen to plant population in our trials were curvilinear. And what that means is that yield did not respond to population in a nice straight line linear fashion. 41 of these trials were a quadratic response function, which simply uh, means, uh, and it's illustrated by the blue line in this graph from LaPorte County in 2016. And what a quadratic response curve simply means is that yield increases up to a point and then further increases in pop plant population actually decrease yield. And so it's a curved response. I sometimes call it a roller coaster response. But 26 of the trials exhibited what's called a quadratic plateau response where the yield increased uh, up to a point and then simply leveled out with no decreases in yield apparent. Uh, we did have a few trials that were yield responded in a linear positive fashion, meaning that as populations increased, yields continued to increase. Uh, we had about a dozen trials where it was linear, but in the opposite direction. As populations increased, yield decreased. These were primarily trials that were conducted during the serious drought of 2012. And then interestingly, we had 11 of the trials where there was no response to population whatsoever, meaning that yields at 25,000 were the same as those at 30,000, which were the same as those at 35,000. It was simply a flat horizontal line. 
Each trial, we made an attempt to subjectively rate the level of overall stress in the field. That stress might be drought, it might be uh, excessive moisture, it might be hot temperatures, but we tried to subjectively rate each trial uh, in terms of minimal stress to severe stress, and we gave them a number from one to three. Stress ratings between one and three encompass what I consider to be the normal range of stress that a field might encounter in any given year, but unfortunately are not predictable. Whereas that most severe rating uh, of four uh, was very severe stress, and again, that was primarily during uh, the 2012 drought. Now, the reason I even bring up this, the ratings for stress is that there was a relationship with the optimum population as such that as stress increased in the field, the optimum population decreased. And so the blue bar represents the least stressed fields in our trial and averaged over those 23 trials, the average optimum population was about 33,000. On our plots that were stress, say at a stress level of three, it dropped to just over 30,000 plants per acre. And then those trials that were severely stressed, again, mostly during that terrible drought of 2012, uh, the optimum population decreased all the way to 22,000 plants per acre. Um, so it's interesting, first of all, that our subjective crop stress ratings were fairly accurate, and perhaps not surprising that optimum populations varied uh, according to that stress. Now, because of that, we decided to actually try to graph uh, the relationship between the optimum population and overall yield level of the field. And that's what this graph is uh, trying to show. And so what, what we're graphing is the agronomic optimum population against the average, or actually I should say the optimum yield for that field. And so there is a, you can draw a straight line relationship through that cloud of data. And it's got a positive slope, which simply means that in general, as yields increased in an environment, the average population, optimum population, also increased. All right. So this line can be drawn. We can come up with a nice equation to describe that line. But if you look at the cloud of data points around that straight line, it's pretty clear that the, this linear relationship does not describe all of the yield variability that we saw. Now, the fact that we saw uh, and could describe a bit of a linear increase relationship agrees with other published re reports. But because that relationship is not very strong, we weren't comfortable uh, actually coming up with guidelines that were based on yield level in a field. And so consequently, what we did was we pooled all of these data together to determine an average agronomic optimum plant population uh, to develop our guidelines. Now, I, I should back up at this point and, and just uh, make sure that I indicate that this agronomic optimum population, that's abbreviated AOPP, that is the population at which maximum yield occurs. It's not necessarily the economic optimum population, but I'll talk more about that later in the presentation. So when we pooled all of our data together, and in the case of this graph, we pooled the data from those trials that had that normal range of stress from one to three on our scale. Uh, because, again, I think that represents the average range of stress that crops are going to experience in Indiana. So when we average those 82 field trials together and come up with a single response curve, it looks something like this dark blue line across the top of the graph. There's a somewhat of a yield increase going from low populations up to an optimum, and then a little bit of a decrease in yield as plant populations increase beyond that. What's interesting to me is when we uh, pooled the data and looked at this was how, I'll say, flat that curve is. It's not a very sharp roller coaster look to it, okay? Uh, 
And while the average agronomic optimum population was just over 32,000 plants per acre at harvest, there was a very wide range of populations that varied only plus or minus one half percent from maximum yield. And that range was from about 28,500 plants per acre to 35,750. A very wide range of final populations that were within half a percent of maximum yield. And then somewhat reinforcing that is even at 23,500 plants per acre to harvest, yield was still 97% of maximum. What this tells me is that today's hybrids are very tolerant to plant population. They're tolerant to high populations, meaning they don't drop off and yield dramatically if you exceed the optimum. But by the same token, if you are, if you are not achieving that optimum population and you're on the low side, yield also does not decrease very dramatically. I indicated that we had some trials where we chose hybrids on purpose to represent less responsive and more responsive hybrids to population. Eight of these trials, eight of these trials used the same pair of hybrids. We only saw differences between those hybrids in three of the trials. Uh, it, they were as per, we would predict from the ratings, but it was only three of the eight trials. And in the other five trials, there was no difference whatsoever for those hybrids. So that's a little disappointing in terms of, of relying on these hybrid ratings. We had another couple of trials where we used the same pair of hybrids. Uh, these were different than the, the first ones I was talking about. And in one of those trials, one hybrid was more responsive. And in the second trial, the other one was more responsive. So again, a lack of consistency on hybrid ratings. And of the remaining 20 trials where we used paired hybrids, we saw hybrid response differences in only seven of those remaining trials. And of those seven trials, hybrid response to population in three of them was opposite of what was predicted. Well, so to me, the bottom line from those 30 trials was that reputed hybrid differences for yield response to populations are simply not consistent or reliable. And so I personally don't put much time uh, and effort into worrying about what hybrid I'm going to plant when I'm choosing a seeding rate to use in the field. I also indicated that eight of our trials included um, two different nitrogen rates, a normal and a higher than normal. Uh, only one of those eight trials exhibited a significant nitrogen rate by plant population interaction for yield response. And even in that one trial, there was, even though there technically, statistically, there was a significant interaction, there was no practical difference in optimum population between end rates. So what this tells me is that within the range of populations that most of our growers are currently using, as long as the grower is using the recommended optimum nitrogen rate, there's no need to further increase that rate if you choose to increase plant populations. <clears throat> Variable rate seeding technology and software have been readily available in the marketplace for quite some time. And of course, this technology allows farmer to, to change seeding rates on the go, either changing it manually on the go or perhaps on the basis of some kind of a prescription seeding rate map. And the underlying assumption behind variable rate seeding is logical and intuitive and it's something like this that there's this assumption that yield response to population varies across a landscape it might be relative to soil map units like is shown on this uh, image or it may be some other kind of a management zone that that's in a field and so because of that assumption then the next assumption is that different areas of a field require a different plant population in order to maximize yield or dollar return to seed. This assumption can be illustrated graphi graphically like this, where maybe there's three zones in the field. They might be soil map units, they may be some other kind of zone, but there's three zones in a the field. Uh, they have different yield levels, and in particular zone A 
is the lowest yielding zone in the field. And you know, the grain yield versus plant population uh, shows a bit of a quadratic response, a bit of a roller coaster response where there's a small increase in yield up to the optimum and then it decreases if you push the population even higher. And, and we can calculate the optimum population for this zone as being uh, something around, oh, say, 26,000 or, or 27,000 plants per acre. Zone B is the one shown in red, and it's a higher yielding soil in general, especially at higher populations, but it has a very dramatic response to population uh, until it hits sort of a plateau and then it levels out. And the optimum population for that zone is something like uh, 38,000 plants per acre. And then zone C is the one shown in green. Uh, it doesn't respond as strongly to plant populations initially, um, but it ends up with a much higher yield at those lower populations. But it has a bit of an increase with regard to population, uh, again, up to a plateau, and then it levels out. But because it plateaus uh, a little sooner than Zone B does, its optimum population is lower, and it's closer to about uh, oh, 33,000 or so. So if you've got data like this that clearly shows zones or soil types uh, ending up with different optimum plant populations, this is the kind of information that will support the use of variable rate seeding. Unfortunately, uh, we often don't have this kind of data uh, to use or to investigate in order to make an intelligent decision about variable rate seeding. Well, these field scale trials that we conducted over the years, the nice thing about field scale trials is that they allow us to evaluate yield response to plant population by soil type or any other identifiable zone in the field. And so the background on this slide happens to be uh, some soil map units uh, from one of our trials in, in Blackford County. And and so the blue represents one soil type, the purple represents another soil type. And by conducting trials on, uh, that are large enough where we can tease out the data from each soil type, we can analyze that yield response separately. <clears throat> now, as it turns out, uh, of those nearly 100 trials, only 31 trials had the right kind of spatial arrangement of soils suitable to allow us to tease out the data and evaluate yield response by soil type. And of those 31 trials where we could look at that kind of uh, evaluation, uh, only 12 of them actually exhibited a soil type by population interaction for yield response to population. Here's an example of a trial uh, where the spatial arrangement of soils allowed us to tease out the data and look at yield response by soil type. This is the trial that I showed earlier. It's the 150-acre trial in southeast Indiana with six seeding rates replicated six times. And you can see the seeding rate map sort of in the background on this slide. But I've also overlain on top of that seeding rate map, uh, I've overlain it with the soil map and they are the more uh, irregularly shaped uh, polygons uh, that you can see on the slide. And they actually represent seven soil map units in that field. Uh, some of them uh, are nice and large and gives us lots of room to pull out the data. There are others like this red one uh, where it's so narrow where we were harvesting across that soil type that we can really can't pull out a lot of data points. Uh, but nevertheless, this was one of the fields where we could evaluate yield response by soil type. And this is what it looks like. We actually did see an interaction between soil types and optimum population. Now, this is showing two years, 2015, 2016. We used the same hybrid in both years. Uh, and we're showing you data from three of the soil map units that were in those fields. They're all silt loam soils, uh, and the names of them were Cyclone, Fincastle, and Sidel. If you farm in Indiana, those soils might be familiar to you, and if you don't farm in Indiana, they won't, but they were all silt loam soils with varying characteristics. And what we're showing on the graph uh, 
is yield on the y-axis and plant population on the x-axis. So we're looking at yield response curves. So for example, this Seidel silt loam in 2015, it's the green dots and the green lines. It had a quadratic response to plant populations. It was the highest yielding soil of that year of the three. Uh, and it tended to peak out uh, at about 35,500 plants per acre. The Fincastle is the red dots in the red line. That was the lowest yielding soil that year in the field. It, it had a, a yield response curve that can be described as a quadratic. You could almost describe it as a just a simple straight line linear response. Uh, and, and it kept increasing yield uh, as we increased plant population all the way up to the last highest seeding rate population we had in the, tr in the trial. Um, and then the cyclone is the blue, and it had, again, a bit of a quadratic or roller coaster response. And, uh, but it was a different response in the Seidel because its optimum population was only 33,000. Well, looking at just 2015 and these different optimum plant populations that we could tease out of it, one might get excited about variable rate seeding. But then the following year, in 2016, with the same soil map units, the same hybrid, the same farmer, yes, there was an interaction between those soils for plant population, but it was a slightly different response. Um, and, and even the optimum populations themselves varied quite a bit from the year before. So <clears throat> the nature of the interaction varied between years. And we've seen this in our other trials were where we've been able to tease out these kinds of relationships. And so, yes, there are interactions with soil map units, at least, and probably with other zones in a field. But because the nature of those interactions varies one year to another and the exact optimum population varies one year to another, it's really difficult to develop guidelines for farmers uh, based on that. And so our conclusion on the merits of variable rate seeding for corn, first of all, spatial variability for yield response population on these medium to fine textured soils in Indiana occurs. And when we do see it, it's most likely due to significant spatial variability among those soils for soil moisture deficits, meaning that soils that are running short on moisture that year respond to a lower population than soils that have adequate moisture. However, in the eastern Corn Belt, it's somewhat low probability of getting inadequate rainfall. And it's hard to predict when we're going to get inadequate rainfall. And normally we have enough soil moisture. And so because of all that unpredictability and, and uncertainty, exploiting spatial variability by using verbal rate seeding is somewhat hit or miss. <clears throat> and the other challenge, frankly, is while we have 31 trials where we were able to tease out some of these relationships, um, they aren't enough. Uh, the, the challenge is conducting enough trials on the same landscapes year in and year out to determine the temporal stability of these uh, responses, meaning how consistent are they one year to another. Uh, that's a big challenge and, and takes a lot of time and effort. So for now, uh, we're just not uh, terribly uh, supportive on uh, the merits of using verbal rate seeding, and we believe that using a just that common range of populations that I mentioned before of somewhere between 28 and 36,000, anywhere in there, you're probably going to be near maximum yield. <clears throat> now, I've spent this whole presentation talking about agronomic optimum plant population, but understand that's not the ultimate goal for the farmer. What's important is the economic optimum plant population, meaning that population that nets the greatest dollar return to seed for the farmer. Because the majority of the yield response functions in our trials were curvilinear, the roller coaster, the quadratic plateau, those kinds of responses, the economic optimum population will almost always be lower than the agronomic optimum population. And the exact values uh, will be determined by the ratio between cost per seed 
and the market grain price per bushel. This graph illustrates marginal dollar return to seed, or think of it as economic, uh, the way to get at economic optimum plant population. And so we're looking at marginal dollar return to seed, which is simply grain income minus seed cost and graphing it out over different populations. Now remember, for this data set, the average agronomic optimum population was just over 32,000. But using $5 market price for grain and $250 cost for seed corn, the economic optimum population that we can calculate from the response curve is only 28,000 plants per acre at harvest. And even then, it's pretty much of a flat curve. Uh, and the, what I'm bracketing in the red here, uh, from about 26,250 to 29,500 plants per acre, anywhere within that bracket, you're within $1 of optimum marginal dollar return to seed. So again, uh, the key takeaway from this is that the population required to achieve maximum yield is higher than the population required to maximize profit. And then, I guess, to follow up with that, recognize that economic optimum plant population is not the same thing as seeding rate. Because remember, population is not equal to seeding rate. So even though this presentation focused on population, um, it's not the same as, as uh, what we're putting down with the planter. And it's usually equal to some percent of the seeding rate. We talk about percent stand, percent success, those kinds of phrases. And the average final population in our trials uh, was 95% of the actual seeding rate. Now, your average may differ, and that's why I always encourage farmers to do stand counts every year, keep track of it. Uh, put it in terms of percent of the seeding rate so that you know whether your average is 95% like ours or maybe it's only 93%, maybe it's 98%. But once you know what your average percent success is on achieving stand, then you can calculate your seeding rate by simply dividing the target population by your average percent stand. So, for example, in order to achieve a target economic optimum plant population of 28,000 plants per acre, the calculated seeding rate would be 28,000 divided by 0 0.95, and that equals uh, just under 29,500 seeds per acre. Well, let me just end by acknowledging a, a few individuals and organizations. Uh, two of our master's students, Jason Lee and John Henniga, relied heavily on the data uh, from these trials for their thesis research and, and did an excellent job with that. Uh, we had a lot of graduate, other graduate students, visiting scholars, summer helpers, uh, all the help from the superintendents and staff at the Purdue Ag Centers, and of course all of our farmer cooperators that we certainly extend uh, a lot of uh, thanks to. And then, of course, this research was sort, uh, supported in part by funds or seed donations from uh, a number of uh, organizations, uh, both uh, at Purdue and, and outside of Purdue, and we're certainly thankful for that support. So let me go back to the picture of me and uh, simply indicate that uh, if, you, if you've got questions on anything that I've shown you today, uh, don't hesitate to contact me at uh, that email address right there. And uh, hopefully this was of some value to you. Uh, good luck with your corn growing uh, endeavors in the future.